All right, hey everybody, welcome back. Tonight we're gonna to talk about juice treatments. So these are treatments done to juice, pre-fermentation. A lot of these will be for whites and rosés, uh, potentially some reds in here as well. Um, but this is also found in our Principles and Practices of Winemaking textbook in chapter three under preparation of musts and juice section. So this will be a shorter slideshow. Um, we'll tag on alcoholic fermentation after this. So for juice treatments, there are really two different types of treatments. There's um, clarification, which is typically like a filter treatment. Uh, and then we have additions, things we can add to the juice to help clarify it. So, so there are juice treatments. So clarification is really just removal of any suspended particles in juice. So that could just be sediment uh, or like particle, small particles of dirt or dust from the vineyard. Um, pulp, it could be like a pectin haze. So that's very normal, it's very natural, it's a very raw product at this point. It just came from the vineyard and got pressed, you know, when you see it in this juice phase. So, um, you know, that's very normal for it to look like that. Um, so the reason that it would be beneficial to clarify the juice before fermentation is it really facilitates a clean product for your downstream processing. If you're starting off with the cleanest product possible um, and then down the road you don't have to do as much work. Uh, this can be tricky though because you can, there is such thing as over clarifying and that would be when you like strip out any nutrients that the yeast might need to have a proper fermentation. So you definitely want to avoid that. So when we talk about cloudiness in wine, we talk about something called turbidity and that is actually measured with a nephilometer and it measures it in turbi turbidity units. So it's called uh, Nephilometric Turbidity Units, NTUs. And here's a really nice picture showing, you know, just how this starts to look. So two NTU, this looks like a really clear product. Um, this looks like, you know, it just came out of a bottle and it's ready to go. Compared to 50 and 100 NTU, this starts to look pretty hazy. Then we have up to, you know, 200 and 400 at that point. It's so murky, you can't even see through the glass. So that is just kind of a really good example of the, you know, cloudiness and how it's measured in wine and how it affects the wine. So that's that's how that's measured, um, as you can do it through NTU. Okay, so there's different methods for juice clarification. Uh, natural gravity settling is what we used in class. Um, there are some larger scale and expensive equipment you can use too that are fantastic, like centrifuge. Uh, we're also gonna talk about filtration and flotation, which is a lot of fun. And I have a really cool article here on flotation if you'd like to learn more about that. And what we have here in this picture, this is a plate and frame filter that is quite literally you know, filtering out the juice um, before fermentation. Okay, so natural and gravity settling. Uh, it's most natural and common practice. If the uh, tank or the container that holds the juice is kept low for extended extended amount of time, it'll help settle it out. It's not going to look perfect after this, um, but racking it off of this is really going to help keep a clean and just like healthy fermentation. And we did do that in class, so it was very nice to see that in person. Um, so yeah, keeping the juice at a low temperature for an extended amount of time is really key to this. Otherwise, it'll just start fermenting on its own um, through, you know, native yeast and bacteria. So that's really important is keeping it very, very cold and making sure that you added the proper amount of sulfur dioxide as well upon pressing. Okay, so next we have what's called a centrifuge. And a centrifuge is um, very, very helpful, but there are some cons to it because sometimes it removes the the positive particles from the juice as well. You can get some aeration with that G-force hitting it too. So you don't want that because it could potentially oxidize your juice. Um, but overall, if it's used properly, it could be very effective for getting clean samples um, and just for you know creating a clean product before fermentation. So this is a little bit what that looks like um, on the mass scale. Okay. So for filtration, um, you can filter juice. It it's, can be difficult to filter because it's so thick and viscous. Um, typically, you'll do a very rough filtration. So think of like cheesecloth, you know, um, something that will just let all of the juice and sugar pass through. 
but you know to kind of leave behind all of the the gunk that we do there uh, then as we're done with the wine and it's done fermenting we'll do a much finer filtration and that will be a sterile filtration where no yeast or bacteria are allowed to pass through it okay on to flotation Flotation is actually a very common practice um, in Germany, from what I hear from my cousin over there. And it's very fun, uh, primarily because I just haven't seen anyone in the U.S. do it yet. And it's, maybe they, maybe there are some people who do, but um, the other previous ones that I've seen around here. So instead of letting the solids settle to the bottom of the tank, um, they pump the tank with nitrogen gas and the nitrogen starts to stick to all the gunk and it brings it to the very top of the tank. So when it does that, um, you are allowed to just hook up with a hose, pump it from the bottom until this top gunky layer comes down, down, down. And as soon as you start getting all this gunk, you shut it off and then you just clean, clean out the tank. So it's a lot faster and more efficient than trying to wait for it to settle on its own naturally. Um, Enzymes are also required to increase the speed and efficiency of separation, which are totally fine and normal to winemaking, um, but of course is primarily used in white and rosé wines. So it takes product from looking like this to looking like this. So very, very big difference. Awesome. And I do have a video for you guys if you want to see how that goes. So again, here's just another kind of picture showing you how it works. So we press the grapes, the must gets put through a strainer and then into a tank. Then that tank's pumped full of um, nitrogen and ooh, there's some gelatin here as well, I guess. And all of the froth gets pushed to the top. And then all of the, the new juice that is about to be newly fermented wine gets pumped out into a new tank and they can start the process. So that is flotation. So those are a couple of methods for clarifying juice. Now we have additions that we can add to juice to help the clarifying process. So the first one we're going to talk about is bentonite. Uh, you guys saw me add bentonite to the wine in class this year. Um, so we'll definitely get more into this in the, just the next slide. We also have something called PVPP and activated carbon. So definitely all things are very common in the industry and used all over. Um, so bentonite is an impure clay formed by the weathering of volcanic ash. Um, it's also the very similar product to what's found in your kitty litter, interestingly enough. It's just naturally occurring in our soil. It um, has a huge ability to hold water and makes like a very interesting slurry. Um, so, and this is not something that we, we consume. None of these additives I'm talking about something that you will be consuming in your wine. They get racked off, they react with something in the wine, they get racked off or they're left behind after filtration. So you're not consuming these things uh, straight, nor should you. Um, so because bentonite is a clay and it's consisted of a lot of minerals, it ends up having a lot of negatively charged particles or ions in it. And these will bind to the positively charged particles of proteins. So proteins are one of the things that creates the haze in juice. So when you make the slurry and you, and you add it to your wine, the clay reacts with the proteins and then it settles to the very bottom of the tank and then you'll rack it off and then start fermenting. And this is not only used for clarifying juice in the beginning, but this is also something that's gonna be used in um, wine stability for heat stability because proteins can come out to play again if a white wine has been exposed to a lot of heat through transport uh, or something like that, if that haze starts to form, you can prevent that from happening by using bentonite before bottling to extract any excess proteins that might be in that wine. So we'll talk more about that later. And we have a little um, link for you guys about bentonite here. Cool. So that helps a lot. That's very common practice. I've used bentonite at every single winery I've ever worked at. So very, very common. Um, it's inexpensive. It's, it's just very easy to work with. Make sure though, if you're gonna take this home and juice at home, it's very important that you use extra hot water. You give it time to swell and that you use a like drill with a paddle option that the people normally use for like mixing paint. Um, do not use a whisk, it becomes a mess. 
So just very carefully, slowly add the bentonite to the hot water and it'll prevent you from any major headaches. Okay, so on to PVPP. Uh, it, PVPP is an acronym for the actual uh, compound's name, which is polyvinyl polyperolidone. So you could set that as your next Facebook password if you needed something extremely complex. Um, it's a very, very fine white powder. And the reason that it is so valued in the industry is because it's very effective at removing any compounds that can turn your wine brown. So not only is it preventative treatment, um, it's also preventative, but it also does treat um, oxidation in all types of wine. It's also used to reduce any bitterness and prevent pinking in wine. So pinking is a phenomenon um, that you can read about here from the Australian Wine Research Institute. And it's something that's found in uh, Pinot Gris is one of the grapes to do it. And what's happening is these compounds are coming out to play, you know, after the juice is pressed. So the juice might look like it's clear and it's a perfectly white wine. And over time, um, it starts to develop a pink hue. So PVPP will help remove those compounds that uh, create that phenomenon in the wine. So that's why that is um, highly valued. Also, if you had a white wine that you pressed too hard, and you extracted a lot of bitterness and even some of that color from, uh, PVPP will be your best friend. It'll help with both of those things. So next on our list is activated carbon. So activated carbon is, you'll see in very big font down here, it's very severe and it's also a non-specific finding agent and that's just the nature of carbon in general. It's the backbone of all living things here on earth. We have carbon, you know, Everything's based off of a carbon skeleton. So carbon is just very diverse and, you know, bonds and reacts with most everything. So um, it's highly valuable in the wine industry, but it can be, um, it can be very severe and it can just remove everything. So there's a long list of things that it does remove. It removes off odors, off flavors, and color problems, little strip color. If you leave it on for too long, or if you add too much, it strips everything. And what's left behind is literally just alcohol and water. So you'll have no color, no flavors, and no aromas. And that's not very fun either. Um, some people actually brush this stuff on their teeth to remove yellowing and stains. Again, I'm not a doctor, but I wouldn't recommend that for the reasons I just stated earlier. But um, yeah, if that helps you remember, helps you remember. So there you go. So there are, so that's kind of a sneak peek into some of the additives or what we call like finding agents before fermentation. We have a whole section on finding agents after fermentation and we'll talk about heat stability, cold stability. We'll talk about some of the things you might've heard of before for finding agents like isinglass, fish bladder, gelatin, egg whites, all that fun stuff. So more to come. And then of course I have some review questions for you guys as well. So hopefully that helps you guys. Um, hopefully you learned something and I will see you guys for the next lecture.